Good morning, everybody. My name is Marga. Um, I am the programs coordinator here at Safe Care BC. And yeah, super excited to welcome you all today to our workshop um, for motivational interviewing for leaders. So with that, I do have the pleasure today to introduce Stacy Boone. Stacy is a certified Canadian counselor and organizational coach with 20 years of experience working in healthcare and human services. Um, her leadership experience includes leading clinical and technical and education development teams and providing education and psychological health and safety leadership for provincial projects and programs. She is a certified motivational interviewing trainer and has been using motivational interviewing in her work for 20 years. So we're very excited to have Stacy here today and all of you. And yeah, with that, Stacy, over to you. Great. Thanks for that, Marga. And it's like when I hear the list of my experience, I kind of realize how old I am. <laughs> um, it's uh, really a pleasure to meet you. I always love to meet new friends. And I'm kind of looking at names to say, yeah, have I met anybody? Because I've been working in healthcare for a while now, mostly within the health authorities, but also did some work way back in community agencies and have uh, dipped into long-term care and stuff myself. And um, I, uh, it's really a pleasure to meet you and to like join you in this important work that you do. And uh, I, I would love to hear your feedback after the session today too, and hear what you think about this. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about me. You kind of got the overview from Marga, which was really nice. And I'll tell you a bit more about my MI experience as well in a moment, but I too just want to gratefully acknowledge I'm working here in Richmond today from home, which is the unceded and ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Sawasan, and Kwantlen people. And I've come to learn it's very complicated history here in Richmond, actually. So, um, and just a couple other things uh, before we get going. Marga's already covered most of the housekeeping. We have a very large group in a very short, intense period of time. So we won't unfortunately have time to meet each other, um, but um, I would, I would, uh, love to invite you to like, you know, um, stop me at any point, chime in with your experience and any questions. And I really hope this is more of a conversation and a discussion than a, you know, a presentation at you for an hour and a half. So um, would love to meet you and, um, and hear what you do and where you're working and how this uh, relates to your work. And uh, I also just want to say too, in terms of like group agreements, you know, this is being recorded and we, uh, I do have some fun kind of skills practice type things that I've built in, but uh, also just want to, um, you know, mention, keep your own counsel about what you share. I, I will invite you to talk about your work, but given that it's um, a recorded presentation, just keep your own counsel about what you share and protect, protect confidentiality always. And uh, last thing I think I'll say is that um, uh, you do have some documents, some handouts to accompany this session. Um, mostly, I think that you can go away and refer to later if you want to try carrying on and practicing some of this stuff um, when you get back to work. And um, I if Marga hasn't sent those already, she will send them your way. And I'll, I'll make mention of them as we go. So I'm going to, uh, we're going to do a whirlwind tour of uh, motivational interviewing, or maybe it's a whirlwind refresh for some of you. I don't know. Uh, some of the things that we're going to touch on today and not, I, I offer other sessions where we do deeper dives into these things and have deeper skills practice and stuff, but I kind of, kind of um, not sure of people's experience and knowledge level. So we're going to start with a bit of an overview and I'm going to touch down on the following things. Really crucial for this session today and really important is the spirit of motivational interviewing and what that means. And I know that sounds a bit woo-woo, but I'm actually going to get a lot more specific and concrete about it um, here today. And uh, that's a really crucial part of all this. Also want to talk about MI and leadership and the connection between those things and how they're used. And a couple of other really core concepts in MI, which include ambivalence, resisting the writing reflex, which is the urge to advise tell, inform, lecture, persuade, uh, and discord and what that is and how it's different from ambivalence. And also touch on how to give advice or direction when it's required, because sometimes it's required, and how you can do that in a way that's consistent with the spirit of motivational interviewing. And the handout for that, which we probably won't have time to practice today, but I'll try and do a quick demo. Uh, you can always refer to the handout, ask, tell, ask later, and use that as a guide. It's very simple. Um, and, and give that a whirl if you like. Uh, 
uh, when you get back to work. So I would love to do, I'm not sure like all your, you know, knowledge and experience levels. And I would love to just do like a quick fist to five here. And you can also enter a number in the chat, like one zero to five or one to five. Um, I'm just wondering where people are coming in at with regard to knowledge or experience with motivational interviewing with zero being like, I heard the word before, or I just heard it when Margaret advertised this, but I don't know what it means. And, uh, or five, Stacey, I could probably like co-facilitate this session with you today. Where, where are people coming in at? Okay, see a couple fists, couple zeros and ones. Okay, so, okay, so it looks like this is kind of, this is newer for most people. Um, okay, that's really helpful to know. And so I actually think this will be a good, really good overview session and we'll see if it, you know, how it lands for you and if it whets your appetite to learn more about MI. Um, and, you know, I want to tell you that where I was first, uh, where I first became acquainted with MI, as Marga said, my background is in clinical counseling and, and I uh, really earlier in my career, I've worked in a lot of different environments and settings and with different populations. But where I first really became acquainted with MI was when I was working in the substance use mental health field um, for Vancouver Coastal Health at the time. And uh, it always really sat well with me. It landed well with me. And um, I used it for a long time. And then I made some pivots in my career and got into education and some leadership roles and other things. And, um, you know, it was always kind of there in the background, but I wasn't really, it wasn't really activated for me. And what's happened in the last few years, maybe five years, is that I started doing work again. It was education leadership related to perinatal substance use. And MI was a core need that was identified across the province for like all groups, all roles with regard to that work. So MI resurfaced for me. And at the same time, I was also doing a certificate in organizational coaching at UBC. And I was like, oh, wow, you know what? These two things really complement each other. Like this MI stuff could be really useful in the context of work. And when I started to look around, I, I was very happy to see that other people were also making this connection, other coaches, other organizational psychologists. And in recent years, um, MI had been um, exploded from where it originated in substance use in the 80s to any kind of behavioral change you can imagine. Like, so sports psychology, sedentary behavior, medication compliance, uh, weight, weight loss, weight management, um, like, dental hygiene, like anything you can think of, MI has been applied to it. And in really recent years, um, people are, there's now this shift and some people are doing some work, like how does this apply in an organization and with regard to leadership? So that's a lot of what I'm going to talk about today, even though the core MI stuff is the same. Um, and uh, I'm just going to give you a moment to look at this quote I have here. This is from the, the text on the, the first text on the topic, which is now on its now in its like fourth edition, I believe. Really nice, pithy, pithy little quote. And I, I would love to just hear from you. Have a look at this quote and, and chime in here, uh, chat or come off mute, whatever you like. What words really pop out at you from this definition? Collaborative, yeah. Growth, yeah. These, this is about change. These are MI are conversations about change. Own motivation, yeah. Own the person's or people's own motivation, not our reasons and ideas for why they should make a change, but their motivation. Uh, collaboration, again, a lot of people that change. Yes, MI conversations are conversations about change. And what we're trying to do is really evoke from other people their reasons and ideas and motivation for change, which in turn creates greater commitment. Now, one that people don't often point out that I want to kind of highlight for you, and maybe this has to do with my background, um, is conversation style. And the reason that I say that is because when I was introduced to MI back in the day, I mean, it only emerged in the mid 80s. I was introduced to it in the mid 90s in my 
counseling work at the time. And it had really grown out of the substance use field and in response to working with people who'd been mandated to treatment. So like they were coming in for substance use treatment because, you know, a judge told them to come or a police or a social worker or a probation officer. And so there were some people at the time doing that work who were like, how do we better engage with these with these people? You know, they're here, but they're kind of here reluctantly um, because somebody else directed them to come. And um, and so I had the sense early on that MI was really for counselors and psychologists and social workers. And, and what I want to say to you is that it's a conversation style. It's not a therapy. And a lot of different professionals use it. So uh, I don't know. I guess if you're like, well, this is kind of new to me, you may not have that history that I have or that kind of misunderstanding that I had, actually. So this is a conversation style. And it's particularly useful at, at specific times. So uh, the quote that I showed you, uh, this is, I just want to mention a, uh, one really great book and resource on the topic. It's called Am I Lead? It's a really good overview of MI and leadership. And um, there's a quite a lengthy quote here. I'll, I'm just going to let you look at it later, maybe when you review the slide notes. But when you look at it, you'll notice it's very similar to the uh, quote from the original text. It's just they're using like leader employee organization language. And uh, what, what was really amazing to me when I started to delve more deeply into this area, and I was really happy to learn because I work in psychological health and safety now, that the people who were doing MI and leadership work were drawing a direct line between MI and psychological health and safety because the skills and techniques that we use in MI signal social and hierarchical safety to people. And I'm gonna explain more about why that is <laughs> as we go along this morning. And this is another really excellent textbook on my, or book, not a textbook, a book on the topic. And, and I, it's a little meatier, there's a little more to it, but there's also a ton of illustrative scenarios and from different organizations. And by the way, these are all helping organizations. So they're all in health and human services. Um, the book's called Motivational Interviewing for Leaders in the Helping Professions. And they also do a really good job of talking about how this applies like with an individual employee, as well as a team, as well as across the organization level, which we'll talk about today. And I think this is a beautiful quote here. It's like, in a nutshell, you're trying to help an employee or a team through a collaborative conversation to resolve whatever it is that's keeping them or the organization stuck. So MI is about leading change. And I know that you have many other roles and responsibilities as leaders, you manage budgets and you communicate and you schedule and you know, you're doing all kinds of things and where this can really be um, enhance your toolkit is regard to the, the kind of changes that you're leading. So, um, when I think of MI, I kind of think of it in, there's two big pieces of it. There's the spirit of MI, and what that is, is an attitude. <laughs> it's your mindset. It's how you show up in relationship with other people, the way you interact with people, what you believe about your employees, what you believe about your own role, your intentions. And then the other part of motivational interviewing is more technical. Um, so there's the ORs, uh, which are the core skills of MI. We'll talk a bit more about that. Open-ended questions, affirmations, reflections, and summaries. There's also um, change talk and sustain talk, listening for those things and strategically responding to based on what you're hearing. Sustain talk is basically when we hear people talking about all the reasons not to change, to preserve the status quo. And change talk is when we hear people talking about the reasons to do something or to make a change. Uh, and then there's also planning, like sometimes we even get into a place of planning with people. And there are also four processes of MI, which I'll talk a little bit about today, um, which are, um, you know, basically the, the sort of trajectory of a conversation or conversations over time. The only reason that I made the spirit of MI thing bigger is because I think that's probably uh, mostly a lot more relevant for what we're talking about today. And if you want or choose to, you can you can go on and grow those other MI skills, which could really serve you if you're 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 working with people where there's like a lot of ambivalence and complexity. But not everybody does that, and that's okay. If you walk out of here like you know with a good sense of the spirit of MI and what that means, and you're you've always got your uh, 
you know, uh, spirit of MI on, that's amazing. Um, and maybe you do deeper technical skills and maybe you don't. And I just, I'm growing my skills because I'm getting different levels of certification as a trainer. And I submitted a conversation tape last week to a coder who like listened to the conversation, coded it and sent me back like a 10 page report with like graphs and tables and ratios of times. And I was like, wow. So you don't have to go there, but if you want to do more skill development, it can get more technical for sure. So let's, let's talk about the spirit of MI and what that means. Cause this is really crucial and it's kind of the foundation. It's like the universal foundation that needs to be in place. And I'm going to invite you, I think it's, it's the spirit of MI. I bet you've experienced it, even if you didn't actually name it as the spirit of MI. And so just to kind of, you know, prime the pump here and get you thinking, I want to invite you to take a moment to pause and reflect and uh, think about a like the best leader you had, or maybe it was a someone who had a really positive influence on you. Like maybe it was a coach or a mentor or a leader or a supervisor or a teacher. And, you know, think a little more, like what was it about them? What characteristics did they have? What did they do? What did they say? How did they approach change perhaps with you or the team? Um, but what was it that they were doing or what, how were they being that was, that you think made it positive for you and what impact did it have on you? And I'd like to just, I'd love to pause and just hear a couple of examples if you're willing. Um, again, either use the chat or come off mute if you like. Brooke, thank you. Listened more than talked. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, a great leader I worked for uh, managed to put things in perspective very mm -hmm. And so as soon as things were in perspective, they either seemed smaller than we thought or exactly as bigger, you know, as, as, as big as they actually were and we were trying to minimize it. So this is all in healthcare, of course. Uh, and, you know, she had a way of letting you know what it actually is and not your perception, what, what it actually is. Okay, so was able to offer another perspective and help you shift perspective and... And I see some people weighing in here in the chat talking about that, uh, that collaboration, which um, is Edith, and I hope I pronounced that correctly. Also, there's collaboration in what you're saying too, I think. Yes, exactly. So um, thanks, Ken, willing to jump in and help instead of saying that's not my job. So involved, collaboration again, involved, um, and you respected them. Great. So... Uh, oh, and thanks, Amanda. Always listens, um, gives employees a voice in the in the thing, values and opinion, ideas and opinions from everyone. Yeah. So you've uh, you've motivated and encouraged input. So that sounds like am I evoking to me? And we'll talk more about that. So as you're thinking of these examples, kind of keep them in your mind. And as we're going through today, like you might want to, like you may notice like, oh yeah, that's, they were doing that in an MI language. We're labeling it a certain way or calling it something. Um, and, and you've probably experienced it. And just want to say too, just a quick note that the literature on leadership mindset refers to like Quinn or Covey and Conant, for example, they talk about these same values and qualities as well. Things like integrity, honesty, compassion, trustworthiness, um, other focused, uh, open, purpose centered. There's a point, <laughs> there's a focus to the conversation. There's an attention, you know, you're doing something. You're not just being a nice person, um, but it, it does line up with some of the other leadership material as well. So, um, Spirit of MI, let's, let's unpack that a little more and talk about what that means. So attitude, mindset, way of believing, what you think about you and your, your role and what you believe about your employees. And when we're in the spirit of MI, uh, this, this acronym is a nice way to remember. And uh, I'm going to talk about each of these, and it's a little bit hard to separate them because some of them overlap, but it's an easy way to remember. So the first one is compassion. And I always like, I've heard this described as empathy in action. And so what that means is it's, it's, you know, empathy is the ability to imagine somebody else's perspective to get us to be able to imagine what they might be experiencing. 
Compassion takes it a step further. It's the ability to put others' needs above your own, to be in service of them, to put your own agenda aside. That is what we're talking about when we talk about compassion and MI. Um, there's also, I'm going to say partnership first. And a lot of you, I think, have touched on this with the collaboration piece, right? This is really approaching people like, you may be a leader and you may have power and you may have a lot of expertise, but you approach people as partners as much as you reasonably can and realize that employees are experts in themselves. And they also have a lot of expertise about the job and ideas about how to do things and experience to draw on. And, um, and so it's really entering in as partners and our role is to help them navigate the ambivalence if ambivalence is coming up about change. And acceptance, this is linked with the partnership. So if we really respect people as partners with their own experience, we also respect and accept that they have the right to choose. And here's the clincher, we don't have to like it <laughs> or agree with it, um, but we, we can respect that it's their choice, even if there's consequences. And even if we're like inside thinking, oh my God, like this is a no brainer. Um, like, are you kidding? Are you, you, you know, you're going to make this choice, but respecting that they have the right to do that. And I, I don't know if this has been in, maybe it came up for you. I hear a lot in leader sessions and other sessions that I do in healthcare. A timely example of this was around vaccine hesitancy. Um, and it's like having to like really, you know, have like feel like real values challenge around people's decisions around that and that the still like be able to respect someone's right to decide because you know what nobody has to do anything really right um so that's a uh, acceptance and then um the, the other piece here is evocation and as some of you have mentioned this in your examples when you talk about great experiences with other leaders or mentors and what we're doing am i is we're using our skills. We're not like we're entering into partnership with people, but we're actively using our skills to help evoke from them, you know, their ideas, their strengths, their knowledge, their ideas about how to, how they might do the change, their reasons to do the change. So we're working really hard rather than taking the shortcut, which is I'm going to just jump in and tell you why you need to do this and why it's a good idea and what the consequences will be if you don't do it. Another really experiential way to understand or remember the spirit of MI is dan it's, it feels like dancing, not wrestling. And um, I know when I'm in the spirit of MI and when I'm not, because I'll, I'll walk out of a conversation saying things like, that felt like pulling teeth. That was really hard. That felt like swimming against the tide, which is a signal to me that I'm trying to push, pull, exert force, make something happen. And I'm battling, <laughs> I'm wrestling with somebody or other people, you know, whereas when you're in the spirit of MI and in that place of compassion, acceptance, partnership, evocation, it's more like dancing. It still might be a little challenging, but it's like, it's kind of surprising and interesting and you're moving together and you're taking cues from each other. So it, you can also sort of understand it in that felt sense, I guess, if that analogy uh, lands for you. And I want to just pause here and check in with you about this. So what do you think so far about uh, the spirit of MI and how I'm describing it? And how does this stuff that I'm saying line up with your own experience? Um, just <laughs> sorry is it okay I'm not really uh, I'm not a quick uh, texter yeah <laughs> please We're, we welcome a range of participation here whatever is easy and comfortable sure um, I find um, this is a very specific example but uh, during the pandemic people have been very run down and honestly most meetings have felt challenging yeah. and not as a result of you know myself or any of the other leaders being overpowering just we felt like the uh, you know um, team members were not uh, open or receptive so it, it mostly have felt like wrestling not dancing 
<laughs> so, yeah. It's, it's been hard lately. We've all been impacted and leaders have been impacted too. And personally as well, I think it's been more challenging for everyone um, and lots of change and rapid change. Like I, I'm sure you, you guys know way you've probably experienced it much closer up than I have in terms of COVID and all the restrictions and the, the stuff that came up around that. Thank you. And I see another uh, other couple other people in the chat here are um, kind of relating to this as well. So uh, interestingly, so uh, this is connected, I think, to what Azito was just describing, like, you know, uh, we're all tired. It's been an extremely stressful time. And um, I want to say that MI is also connected with issues like burnout and moral distress. And um, I actually was just reading something this morning and I came and I'm like, oh my God, this is an interesting factoid. 58% of employees trust a stranger more than their boss. I don't know. That was from Harvard Business Review. I was like, wow. Um, I had done some other looking into this and in a couple other studies and research that have happened, I'll give you an example. Um, in one study, 100% 100, 100 of the nurses, and it was long-term care, by the way, stated that reflecting or discussing work-related situa situations with colleagues and leaders would help improve distress and moral burnout. So, and I saw another study that had similarly very high results in that way. So uh, MI is actually, you know, I mean, I'm in psych health and safety and we do a ton of, we do, we have health promotion and wellness initiatives and all kinds of stuff. But motivational interviewing is one of those in the room interventions that leaders can use to help them develop good relationship, good engagement with employees. And that is a significant protective factor against moral distress and burnout. So when you when you're entering into relationship with people this way, it it can actually also protect them in difficult work and in difficult times. And especially around like um, when we think about things like ambivalence, I mean, it's like it's we're creating space for difficult conversations. We're helping employees to resolve dilemmas that come up. Um, we're, you know, empowering them, evoking from them their expertise, their their uh, their wisdom, their experience. So uh, significantly directly in the room intervention that can help your uh, support your employees in the work. And I think ultimately, somebody asked me yesterday, actually, does it help leaders too, Stacey? And I'm like, I would think so. I don't know if anybody's doing research on that. But if we all feel like if, if I don't know, you guys, you tell me, like, if you felt like your employees felt better and more supported, would that also help you? You know, and would it also create a situation where you're not taking on stuff um, that, that isn't yours to hold, like, you know, to be able to trust employees as partners. Amanda's like, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So there's a, there's a very direct line here between the spirit of MI and how we show up in our relationship with people and, you know, and supporting staff in the difficult work. So it seems like we're, you know, the feedback I'm getting here so far is that people are understanding and it's gelling for you. Let's try something fun. Let's see if we can pick it out in practice. Cause it's one thing, a lot of this stuff, it's not hard, right. To understand it's, it's kind of like easy to get it, I think, but um, putting it into practice is that's, that takes more practice and effort, right? So I'm gonna try a fun little activity here and just let's have fun with it. I'm gonna show a couple of examples and you can either give me a thumbs up, a digital thumb or a real thumb um, or yes or no in the chat or whatever. Is this example consistent with the spirit of MI as I understand it so far or not? And if you want, you can give me a, I don't know, not sure. Okay, let's try one. A team member says, oh my God, they're like today has been so difficult because patients are angry and they have to wait and they just keep taking it out on me. And the leader says, sounds like we need to work on what you're saying. You might want to start out by asking how their day is going. What do you think? Does that, okay. Amber gave a very fast thumbs down. Brooke, Nope, people are, nope, no, nope, no. Nope. That doesn't sound consistent. Right on you. It's not, I would say it's not. So help me, help us understand this. What is it about that that, that sound like doesn't sound consistent with what you understand so far? Blaming potentially, 
yeah, it kind of sounds like it's your fault and you need to do something different. Uh, Brooke, there it is. This one's, I think, really critical here too. No validation of the feelings. I think what this response is missing for me is that compassion. This person just told you they're having a hell of a day, right? And it kind of just completely skips over that and, and, and makes it about the employee and what they're doing or not doing. You know, so it's not supportive to the person. It doesn't validate that they had a rough day and it immediately goes to the, it's your problem and something you're doing. So potentially blaming, yeah. And, and I would say that, and we're gonna talk more about this. I would say it's also an example of that writing reflex, attempting to fix, give advice, persuade, inform, tell, lecture. <laughs> that's, that's the writing reflex. And we do that to people sometimes, right? Okay, let's try another one, fun, eh? Um, okay, let's try another one. The team member says, Mrs. H's daughter is insisting that she join the activities, but Mrs. H is like, she's in pain. She's got a lot of pain. She doesn't want to participate in that. And I actually, I think we should listen to her. Like she's capable of deciding for herself. And the leader says, you know, it's part of your role to be able to work with the resident's family too. So you have to figure this out. Tanya, I didn't even finish the sentence and show you. <laughs> <laughs> she already had a thumb down, a hard thumb down. All right, lots of no, 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 not supportive. Okay, and thanks there, Lakeshore Director. Um, what is it about this that doesn't feel good, that doesn't sound like consistent with the spirit of mind? What's missing or how could it be better? Yeah, not again, not supportive of the person. This person's got a bit of a dilemma on their hands. No collaboration. It's command language. And, and this is, yeah, it's a we problem. It's not a you problem. This could really, um, uh, you're not giving, it's, yeah, commanding solution. Do this directive. And that kind of language, and we'll talk about why this is, how this is, why this is problematic for people. This, you have to figure this out. Uh, can really provoke a reaction from people. And we'll, we'll talk about why that is. Okay, last one. You guys are good at this, naturals. Um, okay, here's the last one. Uh, team member says, so I may be late with the schedule because a bunch of issues has pop have popped up. And the leader says, tell me a bit more what's happening so I can get a clearer picture. Lots of quick thumbs up and yes. You're yeah, like, yeah, that sounds like spirit of mine. What is it about that do you think that that sounds like nice and consistent with spirit of MI? Not blaming, open or hearing, hearing more. It sound, feels like they want to help. Eh? They want to understand. They want to help. Trying to understand. Yeah. Not, not blaming, not snapping judgment, not get it done, you know, engaging and collaborative. So there's, it feels like we're, there's a conversation that's going to happen here, right? Supportive, asking for more information. Neutral, I would say too, right? And thanks, yeah, exercise, like good communication skills, good listening, very neutral, open questions, willing to listen, exactly. Validating, yeah, didn't use the you message. It's, it's about you, great. All right, you guys got it, you passed, we're done, no. Okay, so we're gonna, uh, that's the spirit of MI. And it seems like it's gelling nicely for all of us. And I, and I always say, like, even if you never go on and do any more with regard to like MI skills and training and do a deeper dive, if you can just, you know, remember, always have your cape on. And it's like, if you always have your cape on and you're, and you're showing up in that way as much as is reasonably possible for human beings also under stress, um, that is hugely significant. It's just how you show up you know, and, and that's just your attitude in different situations. So we're going to switch gears now and touch down on some of the more technical aspects of MI. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about these core skills. And I'm also going to tell you, because you guys, I imagine in your work, I'm sure you've had some other coaching and communication skills training. And these skills here are not specific to MI. MI doesn't own them. You've see, if you've done any other training, you've probably seen these before, you know, somewhere. Um, I'll tell you what's distinct with MI with regard to these skills. 
Uh, the, the, the core skills, there are more, <laughs> and there are many types of reflections specifically, but the core skills that we use in MI include uh, another nice acronym here, ORS, open questions, reflections, affirmations, and summaries. Open questions are, and let's be really specific and technical here, the questions that start with who, where, when, what, how, and they invite people to say more. Um, so it's uh, as opposed to a closed question, which someone could answer with yes or no or very limited information. Um, it, you know, we're we're striving for open questions in MI, and you know what's distinct about MI is that unlike any of my other training in counseling or coaching that I've done, um, MI actually encourages us to be really judicious about the questions we use and the number of questions we use. And in fact, the sort of gold standard by really masterful MI practitioners is two to one reflections to questions. Now, I'm going to tell you that this was a little bit of a, I was a little irritated by this actually. And uh, I was like, what? Why would that? Like, so help me out. What do you think? Why do you think in MI they would say, you know what? If you use a question, make sure that you have bang for your buck and it's a really good, important question. Why do you think they would encourage that? Yes, to make sure you're focusing on the right questions. So I think, you know, I mean, questions when they're overused to the other person in the conversation, it can feel like an interrogation. It can feel like a conversation that's happening to them that they're not part of. And even if we're not overusing them, here's the thing. Every time we ask a question, we're making an implicit judgment about where the conversation needs to go next. So we're kind of steering the conversation around um, by, by asking questions. And I don't know if this is true for you. It was certainly true for me. And I've heard other people say it's true for them. But questions seem to come easy. <laughs> they seem to come easier than reflections. I've had to work harder at reflecting. And, I, and other people I know have as well. Um, and yes, Brooke, you, so when, if we let the other, if we can hold back a little, and let the other person offer information, they might, they might raise an issue or describe something that we didn't think of. You know, like, it's like, oh, wow. I like, geez, I didn't, had no idea that was part of what's happening for you. So it really allows the person we're in conversation with to kind of lead the conversation. So what we're doing through reflections is really listening to understand and demonstrating that we get it and that we heard and understood what they said. And reflections, um, there's, I mean, for today, I'll say there's two types. Uh, these are really paraphrases or mirroring back to the person what you think you heard them say. And um, there are simple reflections, which are hopefully not parroting. Hopefully we're not just like repeating their words back, but we're, we're kind of in our own words, paraphrasing back in a form of a statement, you know, you're upset about, um, the shifts you're working these days. Like we're in, in the form of a statement, we're reflecting back what we think we're here we're saying. And it's simple, you know, it's just the goods. It's just what we heard them say. And then there are complex reflections and there are actually many different types of complex reflections, but I'll tell you about a couple. Um, complex reflections might be reflections of feeling. So sometimes you notice somebody's describing something and they're giving you the facts but you're picking up on body language and tone of voice and other things. And you're like, whoa, there's a feeling here and they're not saying it, <laughs> but they're frustrated or they're, you know. So sometimes a complex reflection, we're kind of like reading between the lines or going beneath the surface. Maybe it's a feeling. Maybe we're um, anticipating kind of what they might say next, which is a little bit of a risk, right? It's like, I think they might be saying this or they might say this next. And the important thing is here, we don't have to be 100% accurate when we do these. It's We're just trying to show that we're listening. And even if we don't nail it, 
the other person will respond by clarifying and giving us more information. But they'll be like, like, okay, Brooke's trying to understand what I'm saying right now. So I'm going to, I'm going to offer more to her so that we can understand each other. And um, just a little, uh, as what we're, when we're using these reflections in MI, we're also using them to reinforce change talk. So overall in MI, kind of what we're trying to do is minimize sustained talk and emphasize change talk. So the, the reasons to change, how to change and all that kind of stuff. And so we're using our reflections that way. So sometimes when someone's ambivalent and we hear, you know, sustained talk and change talk, we'll do a double-sided reflection and we'll reflect back both things, but we'll end on the change talk. So it's like, um, so it's, it's deliberate that way. So it's a very reflective listening style is, is, what, I'm, is what I'm saying. And now here's another one, affirmations. This is really interesting. These were also harder for me. I spent a lot of time working on this. Affirmations are not praise. Not that there's anything wrong with praise. Sometimes we offer praise, right? Like we just um, compliment somebody on something. But affirmations are a type of reflection where we're reflecting back to someone based on evidence, what we see in them, their strengths, their values, their efforts, their intentions, desires. So it's like seeing somebody in a deeper way and helping them to see the positive. So unlike, and it typically starts with you, you know, wow, you really, you really put in some effort on this, this project you were working on, or you're really trying to meet that family where they're at. Like, um, so we're acknowledging something in them. We're not saying, you know, I, I loved your presentation today. It's like, that's actually a form of judgment, right? And if we can, um, if we can approve, we can also disapprove. And when we offer people those kinds of praise, they don't believe it anyway, right? Like I might say, oh, my hair looks like crap today. And Brooke says, Stacey, your hair is amazing. Do you think I'm going to believe it? No. <laughs> like that's something that I have to come to believe within myself. And nobody else is going to convince me of that by reassuring me that they think that. So, you know, I'm not saying don't praise is part of it, but affirmations are something different. And uh, so I, I've had to work at this, like constantly, I'm, I'm constantly practicing to see strengths, particularly when I'm annoyed by people. I'm like, what is the strength in this? And often it's a strength that I don't have. <laughs> It's like, this annoys me. They're so detail oriented, but guess what? I'm not, I'm really bad with details. I'm a bigger picture person. So I got to, and then I'm able to go, I'm, I'm actually really glad they're good at details because I'm not, and they're really good at that. So I, I'm listening all the time and trying to pick out strengths because affirmations, and there are people who study these skills and they, and they study them to find out are particular things linked more with like longer term successful change. And guess which one they found is most linked? Affirmations. Because people, remember that like confidence, self-efficacy through affirmations, people feel more confident. They see things, in the, they feel more able and ready and equipped to do things and committed to do things if, uh, when we affirm with them, when we do good affirmations with them. So it's incredibly important. Um, and then finally, there's summaries. And this is also kind of a type of reflection, but it's like we, we only use, you know, one or two or three summaries in a conversation, probably. And we use them at key points in a conversation, like transition points, maybe like when we're focusing a conversation in the beginning or maybe at the middle or maybe when we're finishing a conversation at the end of a conversation. And um, it's we're kind of bringing in multiple elements of what someone has said, particularly when we've been talking for a while or they've said a lot. Um, so, and somebody used a, somebody described this to me once. They're like, imagine Stacy, it's like when you're talking with someone, you're walking through a garden with them. And as they're talking, you're picking flowers. And at the end of the conversation, you hand them back a bouquet. That's kind of the function of a summary. So we might only use it sparingly. Um, whereas reflections, we're gonna use a lot potentially. Let's try it out. All right, so weigh in on the chat or come off mute, whatever you like. Let's have some lightning fast skills practice here with this.
because again, easy to understand, another thing to find the words, right? Uh, let's see, change this to an open question. Did you look at the numbers? How could we rephrase that as an open question? Who, where, when, what, how? Yeah, what numbers did you note? Great, thanks, Amber. How about this one? Did you complete the training? Thanks, Darren. That's a nice one. Nice one. What what can we what can we learn from the numbers? Beautiful. It's great. There's so many possible responses, right? There's no right or wrong answer. There's so many ways to say it, and we all say it differently. Um, how are the numbers looking? Yeah, great. Um, did you complete the training? What's another way to ask that in the form of an open question? How's the training going? Did you enjoy the training? Technically, that would be close because they could say no. <laughs> um, so how might we rephrase that as a, uh, asking? It, simply, how did you enjoy the training would be an open way. You know, then they might they might offer more for that. Um, great. Oh, this is nice, Jen. What were some of the highlights of the training? I like that. That's great. Great examples. OK, let's try a reflection. Simple paraphrase. Oh, I burnt the candle at both ends to get this up and running. I hope it's what you were looking for. What's a simple paraphrase back you can make in that situation? Beautiful, Jen. Sounds like you put a lot of work in this project. Kyla, your efforts are appreciated. Also adding in there, I appreciate the effort you put into it. Great. How about this one? This one's a little harder because it's potentially contentious. Um, great. Uh, great. Nice, Amber. Sounds like you're feeling tired. Let's see what you did. Nice. Your hard work paid off. Great. Acknowledging. So this is, again, you're also, you guys are natural affirmers because uh, I really see in all these responses that you're, you're, you're noting their effort, you know, which is, and that's a affirmation territory uh, too. You sounds like you really challenged yourself. Nice. Look at all these amazing examples. Um, how about this one? And this one's a little harder because you might get your back up with this one. We need more staff. All our problems resolve around one issue, staffing. Might be harder to be neutral with this one. Simple paraphrase back. What are they saying? What are you hearing? Let's look at this together. OK, that might be the second thing you say, Kyla. What would the first comment back be? Okay, let's, here we've got some other examples rolling in. So Amber, yeah, uh, sounds like you're feeling overworked. Why don't we look at the workload? So that first piece is right there. Sounds like you're feeling overworked. That would be a, a paraphrase that, you know, and then, then the next thing is sort you know, why don't we look at this together is kind of a request, I guess. Um, Brooke, I hear your frustration. Sounds like you have some opinions on staffing. Yeah, I do. You know, so thanks, Brooke. Very neutral. And if and I and if I was in conversation with you and you replied to me that way, I would say, Brooke gets it. She's listening, and I'm going to say more now. I'm going to offer more because yeah, I do have some opinions about staffing. <laughs> um, okay, how about this one? Read between the lines or anticipate what the person might be saying next. Oh my God, when I took on this committee, I did not realize there'd be so many angry people I'd have to deal with. Hmm. 
read between the lines. Is there a feeling here? Is there something I might say next? Yeah, Amber, yes, you sound frustrated. And then there's a question like, can you elaborate or tell me more? But even that first part, you're you're frustrated with this is a is a complex getting at the feeling that's coming off me about this. Yeah, Jen, sounds like you're feeling frustrated with this. Uh, sounds like you're feeling frustrated and this committee is challenging. Beautiful, beautiful examples. Okay. Now the bonus round, let's try some affirmations. Imagine someone says to you, yeah, you know, I think that's what we need to focus on. Everything else can wait until then. What's the strength, value, effort, intention, desire that you hear in that potentially? passion. Yeah. May, yeah. Maybe it's, um, yeah. I mean, this person does sound like they've got some strong ideas about this. They're motivated. Um, their ability to prioritize might be something that I, I would note in this kind of example. So great. It's a little harder to do these affirmations out of context when it's one line and you don't have a whole conversation and you don't know the person, but um, this is something like, this is a, a sampler today, but you know, when you when you leave here, go away and see if you can work in some of these skills. Um, now, one thanks, Tanya. Nice example. Um, now, things just got a bit more complicated. We were talking about a lot of like one to one scenarios, like a single employee. What about when it's like a group or a whole team? It's not one person. It's 10 people or 30 people. What about listening in that situation? And the good news is it's the same skills you're using. This was kind of mind blowing to me. I was really, when I went into organizational coaching, I was like, I thought team coaching was a really big mystical thing. And it's like, oh no, it's the same skills that I already use. It's just, there's more people in the conversation. Um, now the thing is it's harder <laughs> because there's more going on. There's more people, there's more conversations, there's side conversations, there's distractions and tangents and, um, you know, all kinds of things, more body language to attend to. It's more difficult. And theoretically you can't listen to more than two people and catch everything that's going on. But there are some things that you can do in this situation, strategies that you can use, but take heart again, same skills, same, you're still using summaries. You're still using reflections. You're still using affirmations. It's just you're making an, an affirmation back to a team or, you know, asking a question of a team as opposed to one person. So some of the things that you might do differently in a team situation are uh, enlisting in the help of a co-listener, you know. So I'm, I might say, uh, Brooke, you know what, I'm, I'm like, I've got the agenda today and I'm going to be leading and facilitating. Could I like tap you in as a listener here just to kind of notice if you're hearing any particular themes? So you can like deputize somebody, ask somebody to help you with the listening because you're not going to be able to do it all and there's more going on. So have a co-listener. You may want to supplement with one-to-one -one conversations or smaller group conversations. So it's like, oh, there was, there was a lot of stuff that came up about that topic in the team meeting. Maybe I need to talk to some people individually or have some other conversations with other small groups about this. So maybe there's more listening to be done. And maybe um, you're even using other uh, platforms in your, in your agency or organization. So things like maybe an, an audit or a quality assurance team or something is, uh, is also listening and giving you information on a certain topic. So, um, but again, same skills reply, just or apply is just more people involved. And to prove my point, let's try one example and uh, offer a reflection or an open question. Team member one says, you know, I don't know, I'm not sure the timing is right for this. And team member two says, yeah, I agree. 
we've been so busy. It's been an exhausting two years. Everyone's tired. Team member three says, I don't know. I think people have been wanting to see this. I think, I know they're tired, but I think they're going to embrace it. And team member four says, we need strong leadership messaging. And team member five says, yeah, I agree with Dan, but I want to talk about that other meeting last week and how that went sideways and that particular topic. And team member six is looking out the window and team member seven just arrived late and team member eight is looking at the phone. Um, what is one reflection you might offer back in this situation or one open question? Doesn't have to get all of it, just one thing. Great, Amber. What's the way we can open up this conversation about this topic to everyone? Nice. Um, uh, a simple reflection might be, we've, we've got a range of opinions about this, you know? Um, so th there's another example on the slide we won't have time to do today, but you can go in, practice with more stuff later if you like. And again, look at these examples and try to fit in other skills like an affirmation or a question or a reflection, or try them in real time with your, with your groups and teams. Now, okay, now it's not 10 people, it's a thousand people um, or 10,000 people. How do you listen across an organization? How do you listen at an organizational level? Good news is same skills are involved. You're still, you're still asking questions. You're still using affirmations and reflections and summaries. The processes and mechanisms are different. So you know, if it's 10,000 people, you can't have 10,000 one-to-one conversations. Maybe the question comes out in a survey or the affirmation comes out in a presentation in a large meeting or a reflection or a summary comes back in an email newsletter. Processes and mechanisms are different. You're still using the same skills. You're still in the spirit of MI, but uh, definitely using other mechanisms, maybe even social media, probably more likely using other teams and listening by proxy in a large organization. So, or if you're in a really senior role, maybe you have management teams who you're listening to or it, a groups of employee representatives who you're listening to um, about the rest of. So it's, it's a different scale, but same skills, different processes and mechanisms. I hope that's a relief. <laughs> um, Okay, now another technical point we're just going to touch on. I don't want to, I don't have time to spend a lot on this, but there are four processes in MI. And if you've done any other, especially like coaching, training, you've probably seen similar type sort of stages in a conversation. So uh, MI labels them this way, but they're similar to other training I've had for sure. Um, and they're not flat and linear and they don't always go one, two, three, four, as they're laid out here on the slide. There's usually organic and you're kind of moving around, but here they are um, engaging. That is showing up in the spirit of MI, listening to understand. It's kind of like uh, being present. Shall we travel together? You know, um, creating that sense of trust and relationship with people. And, uh, and then we're not just being nice people. Um, we're focusing, there's a point, right? And especially if we're at work, there's, there's some point to the conversation. It's a conversation with intent. So when we're focusing with people, we are determining the direction. It's like, where are we going? What are we talking about here? Um, so there's, there is, uh, and you know, maybe the other person is deciding what you're gonna talk about, not you, but it's something you're agreeing to together. And with evoking, this is pure MI. This is like where I said, especially with MI, we're using our MI skills to draw out from other people all their perceptions, thoughts, ideas, resources, strengths. Um, how are we going to do this? Why would you do this? You know, all that kind of stuff. And this is where those, if you do more advanced 
uh, skills training, it can really help with this. And then finally, sometimes you get to planning, right? Um, you, yeah, it's actually like, okay, we're there. We're going to do this. How are we going to do this? What are your ideas about how we're going to do it? How are we going to do it? When are we going to do it? Who's involved? And all those details of the planning. And just like, remember the individual examples that we saw, um, this, you know, this applies at all levels. So whether you're, you know, these processes apply with an individual, with a team and with an organization. And I think maybe where it often goes wrong is when we rush ahead to planning. And just like you saw with the individual, what happens when you do that? No compassion, no understanding, um, feels kind of abrasive and harsh maybe, or the person feels manipulated, right? And the same thing can happen in an organization or with a group. Um, so, and kind of similar when we're talking about, you know, individual versus team versus organization, the same, the processes are the same. Again, the mechanisms may be different. You know, so you're using other tools and other platforms um, when you're trying to manage that number of people. Okay, now this is super interesting stuff to me. This is a core concept of MI, and this is what I think MI really adds. Like when I think about my counseling and especially my coaching now and my work in organizations, what I think MI really adds is value around this idea of ambivalence. Um, and ambivalence, just so we're all clear about what this means, because there's lots of ambi words and the picture is a giveaway. It's like when we have mixed feelings, when we're of two minds about something and some, you know, sometimes like both things are true. And the thing about MI is the, the assumption is, or the idea is, is that we ambivalence is a normal and expected reaction when people confront change. So we really create space for that and we help people to navigate that ambivalence when it comes up. And I don't know about you, but whether I think personally or whether I think about many work examples that I've experienced, a lot of change is not simple. And even the stuff that I think is simple, I'm like, I was gonna do that thing and yet somehow I haven't done it for two years. Um, <laughs> it's like very few changes are really simple changes where you just make a decision like throwing a switch and you do it like so many things are uh, more complex than that. And it in an ambivalence is there for us around it. And I just want to pause for a second and say, you know, because I think, you know, like, what's it like, you know, what do you think about? Is it is it easy to be ambivalent at work? Do we allow for ambivalence at work? Is it easy for how easy is it for a leader to be ambivalent about something? or and even call up in your own mind, maybe a change you were leading or a change you're facing yourself that you have that ambivalence about. Sustain talk and change talk. Reasons to do it, reasons not to do it, you know? I don't know about you, I would love to hear what you think, but I will say that, um, I'll tell you one thing, it was a lot easier for me when I was working with clients <laughs> directly to be super supportive and neutral and not do the writing reflex and just allow them to be ambivalent and make a choice. I, it was a lot harder when I was in leadership roles and I felt responsible and there was pressure on me to make certain things happen. It was way more challenging for me. And my, my sense is in all the places I worked that there's not a lot of space for this. It's like, you're on board with the change or you're not, you know, like we say things like toe in the company line, right? I, I have, I mean, I, maybe it's leader dependent too. I have a leader now who's, who's much more comfortable to allow for different opinions and perspectives and have discussion about things, but that isn't generally been the case, <laughs> but uh, anyway, it, it, it'd be interesting to know, like uh, if other people have had similar or different experiences about ambivalence. I was in a session yesterday and a leader was saying, you know, there it's what's really hard for me as a leader is when, you know, my team is ambivalent about something and I'm also ambivalent about it. And yet I'm the one who's tasked with leading the change. And it's like, yeah, there's a special kind of pressure <laughs> on a leader in that situation, right? 
So um, MI really allows for this. Thanks, Amber. Yeah, most changes I've run into work are uh, yes or no. Well, great, that's easier change, right? Um, and you may not need to pull on other MI skills in that situation. It's when people are stuck and they're not moving, that's when it's like, oh, there might be ambivalence here. And this is where I'm gonna really be sure I'm in that spirit of MI and maybe use some of these other skills to help talk through this with people and help them resolve it. So um, if you look at like quality assurance literature or project management literature, ambivalence is actually classified as a form of resistance to change. And back in the early days of MI, um, they used to talk about rolling with resistance, like with those mandated clients or patients, they'd be like, you got to roll with the resistance. And this is something that's changed in MI because, geez, I don't know, how does that work when we label somebody or a group as resistant to change? You know, like what, you know, we're making all kinds of judgments there. So now what we talk about is, no, it's about ambivalence about change and how do we support people through the ambivalence? And it's an ambivalence is not resistance to change. Um, ambivalence is a normal and expected reaction to change. And when we look at the healthcare system, when I looked at when I when I think about the health authorities where I work that are huge, like tens of thousands of employees, it's a it's a recipe for ambivalence because it's it's complex. There are so many people, conflicting roles, conflicting goals values differences, all kinds of dualities. So it's a setup for ambivalence, right? And I actually just saw some research on this. There's a good paper, if anyone wants to go looking, called Ambivalence Across the Levels of an Organization. So maybe that's something we'll see more of in the future. But it's not a bad thing. Ambivalent, it might feel challenging as a leader because you're like, you're trying to get something done and, and you're feeling like people are stuck and it's not happening. But there are benefits to ambivalence if we can entertain it. Um, because if people can hold multiple perspectives or if a team can have multiple perspectives or teams within an organization can have multiple perspectives on something, that makes for more flexible thinking, creative problem solving. Um, ultimately, it might translate into better decision making and also more commitment <laughs> when we do make a decision about something. So it's not a bad thing to be avoided. It's a natural reaction to change and it can actually serve us really well if we can support it well. Now, what happens often is when we, when, whether it's clinicians or it's leaders, when we run into ambivalence, what we do is there's a tendency to do the writing reflex to people, especially if we hear them some articulating some reason to do something. We're like, oh, well, I'm just going to like hammer on that point that we need to do this. And these are all the reasons why we need to do this. And so we engage in this thing that we call an MI, the writing reflex, which means giving advice, telling, lecturing, informing, persuading. Um, and when we do that, what happens is it backfires on us. We create a counterforce. <laughs> in the other direction. And I have a really good little video here. It's two minutes and it's the best summary I've seen on the topic. And uh, it actually is about more like of a healthcare example, like a, a person, but I, I don't think it's, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to be able to extend this to like employees and leaders. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna play this two minute video. Maybe if somebody could just give me a thumbs up that you can hear it, okay, that would be great. Let's return to our example of an ambivalent participant who, like most people considering a change, is balancing back and forth between both sides of an issue. Perhaps they want to quit smoking or eat more healthily. To an outside perspective, the choice between changing and not changing may seem clear. And, of course, providers naturally want to encourage and argue for the healthier choice. However, when a provider takes up one side of the argument, the participant feels this shift in balance and wants to defend the opposite. The ambivalent participant doesn't start out voicing only one side of the issue. It's a natural reaction to a provider taking up the opposite half of the discussion. It's at this point the participants are often labeled as resistant or in denial, when in reality they are simply working to restore their back and forth ambivalent balance. The provider worries they haven't been clear enough or perhaps haven't provided enough information. 
the participant responds in kind, chances are they have collected most of the information and rationales for both sides of the issue. They are not in short supply. The provider becomes insistent, believing that if they can make the participant feel the weight of the consequences, they will come over to the other side. But as research shows, people put the most weight in their own words. They believe what they hear themselves say over what others say. And when confronted with the writing reflex, they hear themselves arguing for all the reasons not to change. When this happens, the writing reflex response is to, as stated in Motivational Interviewing 3rd Edition, confront the person with reality, provide the solution, and when you meet resistance, turn up the volume. Such behavior can result in the participant actually convincing themselves they really don't want to change and even leaving the conversation or treatment setting altogether. This can reinforce a provider's belief that the participant was not ready to change after all, when in fact, it's not a question of readiness to change. It's a question of how comfortable the practitioner is with embracing the artful balancing act of ambivalence. When you think about that, So the writing reflex they talked about, you know, they mentioned something in the video, people prefer their own ideas over other people's. And this is uh, related, this is part of a phenomenon called um, psychological reactance. And this is, um, this is hardwired in us, it's evolved in us, and it's kind of subconscious, actually. You remember at the beginning of the session today, I said the techniques and skills of MI signal social and hierarchical safety to people. That is related to this uh, psychological reactance thing. Here's the thing. As soon as we, we feel like somebody is telling us what to do, it threatens our social and hierarchical safety. And so um, we, you know, like we feel challenged. We feel like our autonomy and freedom is being threatened and we react against it. And it's not even a conscious process. It's a knee jerk thing. I don't know if you can relate to this, but if I ever feel like someone is telling me what to do, it feels like something rears up in me. It's like an instinctual reaction. I resent being told to do that. And I'm almost going to counter the other way. So, and the other part of it is part of the psychological reactance is again, we have we prefer our own ideas over to others. So your reasons for why I should make the change have way less value and weight to me than my own ideas to make like reasons to make the change. So when we show up in the spirit of MI and we don't do the writing reflex to people, we're signaling to them, you're safe. This isn't a competition. <laughs> and, and so it protects that psychological safety. Sometimes what we experience with people, though, is not um, ambivalence about an issue. It's discord. And discord is something different. That is, and we, we kind of have to figure out to be able to discern between these two things. Ambivalence is about an issue. Discord is problems in our relationship. <laughs> it's disharmony in the relationship. So things that, um, and when we do the writing reflex, that can create discord in our relationship. And the signs of discord are interrupting, defending, digging their heels in, attacking, withdrawing, leaving, being stubborn, squaring off or being adversarial. If these things are happening, then that's a signal that it's like, oh, this is about our relationship. This isn't about an issue. This is a problem with me. And here's, I want to say to you, you know, it can happen if you do the writing reflex to people, but sometimes discord meets you at the door. It's like you didn't do anything to deserve it. It's just there, maybe based on people's past experience, maybe because you're just you know, the new leader who's coming in. You know, sometimes it's there, regardless of why it's there, you do have to work with it and deal with it. And so if discord is what you're experiencing, then it's a signal that it's a relationship issue. And the fix for that is relationship. So that means going back to the spirit of MI, back to those core skills, listening to understand, helping the person to feel safe. That's what's going to help that with that re-engagement. Now let's try this out quick. Just a couple of examples. I'm going to share an example and tell me what you think. Is this sustained talk? 
discord or both? Is there a combination of things going on? Okay, how about this one? I can finish this report or I can work with a new team member, but I can't do both. And you know what, frankly, if you worked on a unit, you'd realize this. What do you think? Sustain talk, discord or both? Discord. Kyla, thank you. Which part of that sounds like Discord to you? The personal jab at the end. The ouch. If you worked on the if you worked on a unit, you'd get that. Like so that ouch, that personal jab that you feel, that's a sign of Discord. The first statement is actually ambivalence. It's kind of more neutral. It's about like their workload or their capacity or taking on the student or not. You know, that's that's about an issue. That's ambivalence potent or sustained talk. And but the other piece, that is a signal that it's like, oh, that's discord. That's about relationship. Let's try one more. Um, I just I don't have time to work on this right now. Is that sustained talk or discord or a combination? I would say this one is straight up sustained talk. I'm not getting this, unless there was a tone of voice or volume or body language going on here. This sounds like, this is about my, my, my workload. This isn't about you or about my relationship with you as a leader. And uh, if you guys wanna test yourself later, you can look at the, uh, look at the slide notes that you have and try again. So uh, the, if it's a discord thing, not an ambivalence thing that's happening, um, often the, there are other ways to approach that, not MI, although relationship and spirit of MI is always good. Um, if it's something going on with the team or your relationships within the team, um, there are, are, are models, common one being Lencioni's five dysfunctions or functions of a team that are more about like team conflict and discord. Um, can get at that kind of thing. And that's the stuff that the people who are doing MI and leadership work point to. So we're, we're actually, oh, unbelievable, reaching the tail end of our session. And I just have one more thing I wanna tell you about. And there's a sheet that you can take away and practice with later. Um, in our, in our um, leadership communication, there are different styles that we use and they all are valid and they all have their place. And I've spent our whole time together telling you about the, you know, don't give advice. Um, but the fact is sometimes you do have to give advice or information. So guess, fortunately, there's a way that you can do that that's also still in keeping with the spirit of MI. So uh, I think a skilled leader is drawing on all these different communication styles that range from directing to delegating, but they're doing it intentionally and they know when they need to shift gears. And when we do have to be directive, like it's a new employee and we're giving information, for example, um, and clear direction is needed, here's a technique we can use to do that. And I'm not going to be able to, um, we won't be able to practice with it, but I, I encourage you to take the handout that you got called Ask, Tell, Ask, and look, have a look at it and try it out and see what you think in situations where you have to give information or advice. And the sheet that you got, you notice there's a, in the left column, there's the steps. It's like this, the, the technique is, or the skill is ask, tell, ask. Also heard this called elicit, provide, elicit. Nurses use this a lot, but it's newer to me. Um, on the right-hand side of the sheet, there's options and tips. So they give you examples of how you can say it or tips to remember for each step. And um, we'll go through a little bit of that now. So the first step, if we, if we need to give direction or advice in a way that's, you know, um, the first thing we do is we ask. And there's two ways to do that. We ask for permission or we ask, what do you know or what do you want to know? <laughs> and there's ways to say it are, um, there's something I noticed I'd like to tell you about. Would it be okay if we talked about that now? Or 
what, what would you like to know about? Uh, or there are several things we could talk about. Where would you like to start? Or what information can I help you with? So those are some different ways to, um, uh, to say that. And there's more examples here you can refer to later. Then there's the tell. And this is, this is um, it just needs to be brief, plain language, a relevant, present focused, a couple of pieces of information, not too much, not going on and on, small doses, plain language, maybe using a demonstration or a diagram or something, or here, let me show you how to use a software. Um, and uh, neutral, we're not trying to, we're not trying to persuade we're just neutrally offering something. And, and another really important thing here is avoiding that command language and instead emphasizing choice. So um, if you choose to, you could try this as opposed to you can't, you must, you have to kind of language, which is gonna trigger that psychological reactance for people. And then there's finally the ask, and we're simply going like, what did you think about that? So I wonder what this means to you, or I wonder what you think the next step is. Or in some cases, if it's important that you check understanding, there's something you can use called the teach back, which is a way to check understanding, but you're making it about your communication, not their understanding. So it might sound like, so um, I, wanna make I wanna make sure I explain it well. Could you show me how you're gonna, you're gonna fill out this report? Or could you, if you had to show someone else on the team how to use this software, um, how would you do it? Um, and so if there may be those, those moments where you do have to do that teach back thing because it's important that um, people understood or that you explained well, again, it's about you, not them. Because if you say, did you understand? People are you know, way less likely to say, no, I didn't actually. So um, I have a moment actually, if someone wants to do a really, I'll do a demo of this really quick one. Uh, this is an example I often use at work. But, and even though you may not be familiar with it, I think it'll be easy to grasp if someone would be, someone will be a volunteer with me and I'll do the harder part. You just kind of got to play along with me, pretend you don't know anything. Anybody, anybody help me out? I can do it. Oh, Amber, <laughs> you're champion. Thank you. I don't you. want to leave you hanging. <laughs> Thank you for your empathy and mercy. Um, <laughs> okay, so here's the deal, Amber. We're going to pretend that um, you're a new employee, and I'm going to tell you about how to call in sick using what we use at work, which is called the employee absence reporting line, okay? Um, okay, Amber, hey, wow. First two weeks on the job, it's been rapid fire. Things have been going really well. And I actually, I just realized that I hadn't yet talked to you about how to call in sick if you need to call in sick. And I wonder if you would mind if we just talked about that now. Sure. Okay. So we have um, the PHSA, like Provincial Health Services Employee Absence Reporting Line. You'll hear it commonly referred to as the Pearl Line. The phone number is a 1-800 number on the back of your employee ID card. If you need to call in sick, if you just call the 1-800 number, It'll walk you through some voice prompts that you answer, and then it will connect you with my voicemail and you can leave me a message. And the call won't be logged unless you stay on the line and leave me a message. So okay. it's, uh, it's important that we follow this and I want to make sure that I explain it well. I wonder if you wouldn't mind just telling me back what you understand about it. Um, I have to phone a 1-800 number and leave a voicemail. Yeah. Like basically now, if I felt like Amber, if I felt like I wasn't clear, I might loop through that again and clarify the part that wasn't clear, but that's kind of it. Did you hear the steps there? The ask, tell, ask it's so give it a whirl. If you think it might be uh, relevant for different situations um, that you encounter with employees, try it out, see how it goes. Okay. So we're at that, we have a few minutes left. And I wonder if you, we've touched on a lot of different stuff and I wonder if you would help me summarize like key points um, that stood out for you from this session today, key takeaways, key points.
or skills. Awesome. Open questions, affirmations, reflection summaries. Cape, the spirit of mind, hugely important. Always have your cape on. Compassion, acceptance, partnership, evocation. That's the spirit. That's the attitude we ideally want to show up with. Stacey, is there time for a question? A question sure, for yeah, please. Um, Dancing, yeah. not wrestling. Yeah, another way to think of the uh, spirit of MI. Awesome. Yeah, I, I like that one too, the dancing, not wrestling one. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the question that came through, um, what happens if there's discord because of past feelings towards past leaders? And now I am new and having to make changes right away before a chance to build up the relationship between a team member and myself as a leader. Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a tough situation. Um, and I would say, even though it sounds like it's, that's the kind of situation where you're walking into it and you didn't do anything to, you know, create it, it's, it's there and it's something that you have to deal with. And even, and maybe the person is, uh, had a bad experience and is not trusting of other bosses. Remember this morning I said 58% of people trust a stranger more than their bosses, not because, you know, maybe based on past experience. So it's, it, it still means that there's um, relationship building that you have to do with that person as a leader. And I think like through change, you're really that relationship engagement spirit of MI is really front and center. And at the same time, you're also listening for like change talk and sustain talk and getting sense of where are they at with regard to this change, but knowing that relationship is really critical in this situation because they've had some vast experiences. So we're always doing both in parallel. And maybe sometimes you have a good relationship and it's like, ah, we're just, we're talking about the change and we're getting into planning and, and things are good between us. And I don't have to worry so much about that relationship. And then at other moments, like you're describing, it's like relationships really important. It's the bigger circle right now. Um, and we're not going to get anywhere with regard to this change if we don't have good relationship and they don't trust me. Uh, it, that was my question. And I just, um, the whole thing with the, like, if you, if I bring anything up, it's just like an automatic knee jerk response of like, we don't have time. We can't do that. Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> do you just let, let the change slide, change slide for a little bit and just try and build up the relationship first or do you? Uh, well, you might be like talking with them about it, even like, okay, so in a situation where you don't really have a choice, and they don't have a choice, it's not something that's flexible, you're not going to be using those other MI skills to have a conversation, but you can still show up in the spirit of a mind. And you know, there was something recently, a situation I had with my own boss, um, a misunderstanding about something. And, you know, we had a conversation about it. And I was able to she was able to have a conversation with me where I could talk to her about it and my reactions and feelings. It didn't change anything. We still haven't resolved the issue, but we kept our relationship and I feel good about it. And I'm like, I feel better just having had an open conversation with her about it. And I understand her perspective and we've agreed we're both working on it, you know, but there wasn't an easy resolve. But even the fact that she listened and that we have good relationship can be a buffer for those those times when it's not that simple or it's it's you know i don't have any control over this i'm not going to try and like it's it's something that we have to do you know um brooke i see a question here i wonder okay the question i wonder how you think we might proceed and uh what about staff who think that it isn't in their job description to come up with the answers and they may not be open to that kind of open question yeah, so the samples that I've given you are just example statements. They're not like the only things you would say. This is not a script. They're just examples to help clarify. And you're going to have to find your own words because how you say it, Brooke, is going to sound different than the words that might come out of my mouth. I was talking to somebody the other day and I was giving examples and they're like, okay, stop. Stacy. I don't talk like that, okay? I'm like, I know you don't. <laughs> I do. These are just examples, right? You got to find your own words. So we all have to go through the awkward, um, the awkward, um, the awkwardness of finding those words and making this part of our language kind of thing. 
And so, and maybe that question, you know, how do you think wouldn't be an appropriate question in that situation? Cause there actually isn't another option. It might be like, so what do you make of this? Cause you're checking their reaction. It might not be, you're not going to ask for, you know, well, give me other opinions about how you think we might do it when there's really nowhere else to go, you know? Great. And thanks, Jen. I appreciated the practical application and examples. Awesome. Love it. Thank you so much. Thanks, Brooke. Well, it's really a pleasure to meet you all and great. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join me and be here today. And uh, it was a lot of fun. Thanks for your participation.